Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Not Too Combo Book. This being a show where I talk about TV shows that are adaptations of combo books. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about the latest episode of Lucifer, the latest episode of Legends of Tomorrow, as well as the latest episode of I Zombie. Like always, if I'm talking about something you want to listen to, you can always look in the description down below. I include a time when I start to talk about each of the respective shows. So, for example, if you want to hear what I have to say about this week's episode of Lucifer, you can skip to what I have to say about this week's episode of Legends of Tomorrow, and or skip to what I have to say about this week's episode of I Zombie. But the first thing I'm going to talk about is this week's episode episode of Lucifer. So it's kind of interesting because this uh, particular case is a case that's close to the home for um, Pierce or rather Kane. And it's kind of interesting because we see like basically this is about a copycat killer of a case uh, he did back in the fi late 50s and 58 in particular. And it's kind of interesting because it's like holy crap. It makes you wonder like how long was Kane as a you know cop. It's something I didn't, I didn't I really think about too much. It's like and I don't know if that's something we'll ever kind of get much of a look at besides this episode, but like more into who he was before him. So it's like, has he always been a cop? You know, I guess considering his circumstances, you know, having murdered his brother and everything, he wanted to kind of make up for it. So he wanted to solve crimes, maybe. I mean, especially considering he's kind of like the first murderer. So maybe on some uh, psychological level, he feels responsible for all murder that exists. Maybe how like Lucifer gets associated with all evil in his mind, he gets associated with all murder. Maybe that's not the case. Maybe it's, maybe it is just simply like I killed my brother, so I kind of have to. I feel responsible about getting justice for other people. Um, I don't know. It's just kind of interesting, um, and it ties into the episode because we have a copycat killer. And all the while this is happening, Lucifer's kind of getting like super hurt by the fact that it's like, well, he's got you know Chloe and Pierce kind of getting closer and closer, and it's bothering him, especially when he's got Ella being like, oh yeah, they're totally like, oh they totally bone. And she's like, and he's like, and Ella's being like, no 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 never mind. I mean, it's not what I feel. What you and Chloe have is special. I don't know like whether Ella a hundred percent knows how Lucifer feels about Chloe. Like the way like she probably takes him at his word when he's like, oh no no we're partners and everything, because I think. She probably just li literally thinks that. She probably doesn't read the other underlining um, stuff about how he really feels. Like, a lot of other people can tell. Like, Linda can obviously tell how Lucifer really feels about her. Aminadil, easily tell. Like, the only people... Typically, it does seem like everyone else is kind of a little not as... I don't know. Maybe um, some of the other characters are a little clearer on how he feels. But nevertheless... Um, I think the only other character I know for sure that knows is like Candy, like his, you know, ex-wife. She's the only one that knows for sure, too. But nevertheless, obviously he's being a little lashing. I was like, no, 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 we don't need Pierce's help. And obviously he's being a little snippy. And obviously, like he typically does, makes every case about himself, which I've kind of brought up recently. It's kind of an interesting thing because lately it's almost been Chloe who's been kind of making cases about herself. Obviously, she kind of gets pissed at Lucifer because it's like you're so caught up in all of this crap. And they're like, there's literally a serial killer on the loose. It's it's sad because even he even talks to Dan about it and he's like, okay, so how did you handle me me basically taking your spot? Which Dan's like, uh, no, you didn't take my spot. Which Lucifer's like, well, fine, whatever. And it's like, well, because I realized that we had two different relationships. Like, it's okay with her having like her relationship with you is very different from her, her relationship with mine because you popping into this situation wasn't what affected our relationship. I like our you know everything he was kind of associated with at the time, their relationship fell apart because of them exactly, them themselves. It had no outside help from Lucifer popping into the picture. So meaning like, okay, they're varying relationships, which that obviously put things a little different perspective for Lucifer, um, especially when it kind of gets revealed who the killer was. I was kind of surprised about that because I was like, oh, it's got to obviously be the, like, the dude that's kind of treated like crap at the uh, station that they had to like do that whole fake relationship and the whole fake cheating thing with. Um, you could tell Chloe was speaking from the heart when she was talking about all the things that kind of make, you know, Pearson. He was like, oh, he's he's so brave, he's so handsome, that type of thing. So and you could tell that was cutting deeper and deeper into Lucifer. But after, you know, finding out the killer being the one that's like, oh, they have no right to do this. They have no right to cheat on you. It turns out to be the guy who's actually living in the um, Broken Hearts killer's uh, house. Uh, cause I was wondering about that. Was it gonna be a twist where it's like actually still alive and whatever? I mean, but, if it, but to be fair, like really quickly early on, they're like, no, I mean, for one, it was a long time ago. Plus, he ended up dying in prison. So I was like, oh, did he get the wrong person or something? Maybe this is the child or the real killer. But it's like, no, they literally, him and his partner at the time, Ray, literally caught the dude red handed while he was in the middle of the act. So there's that. It's a whole situation of like, the reason why Hoffman, uh, the original killer, went on that killing screen in the first place was because he was cheated on and basically he wanted to get quote unquote justice for everyone. It's like, oh, like no one should cast you aside and treat you like that. It's like, no, like if you're in a relationship, someone be with that person type of thing. Um, they were just lashing out because of their own particular situation. And this killer uh, was kind of the same way. Um, 
It's kind of interesting because obviously their first suspect was a uh, Neil. And if I'm not mistaken, I could be 100 percent wrong, but isn't that the actor who played Morgan in um, Chuck? I think it is, but I could be wrong about that. I thought that's kind of interesting. Um, but nevertheless, it did kind of put things in perspective for Lucifer. Like, I can't tell someone who to date. Like, no matter how I feel about Chloe, I, I do realize that we have a different relationship. Even when he was talking to Pierce, Pierce was like, oh, I didn't know you were thinking. He's like, no, we're not a thing. It's like, okay, so she's a partner, so okay, we're free to date. And I'm like, oh, that sucks. Because Lucifer can't admit how he's really feeling that he wants to be with her. But, you know, just because there's so much to it. Because for him, it's like, no, 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 no. Especially until until I remove my father from the situation, I can't say for sure that any feelings Chloe potentially has for me, that anything between us could be real. So he doesn't want to jeopardize that by changing the relationship. It's like where they are is good. Obviously, he wants more, but he just doesn't. In his mind, is like, no, no, I can't do that until my father's kind of removed from the situation, until I free her of whatever control my dad has over her to kind of be in my way, in my life, in my path type of thing. So, And because Pierce's whole situation is obviously like, we end up seeing in the past, obviously, he dated, um, he was, there was a uh, bartender he was getting close to while he was working on a case named Kay. She actually kind of put things in perspective for him, kind of helped him look at the case from a different perspective. And even though they were getting close or whatever, Pierce kind of just, he was like, no, nah, I'm getting, I'm getting a transfer. Cause we do end up finding out the person she ended up dating was Ray. So, uh, was, was his partner and they ended up having a granddaughter, uh, Maddie, who looks just like her. Um, I, I need to learn that actress's name. I see her pop up in a lot of stuff and I just can never, I can, I can't remember what, like, it's, you just, she's a familiar face you see quite often. I just, I can't, I can't think of anything specifically like recently I've seen her, but there's there are plenty of things. Uh, but nevertheless, I was thinking the twist was going to be like, oh, yeah, actually, that that's her his grandchild. I'm sure Kane's been pretty smart about that over the course of the years of being like, oh, no, 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 not having children with anyone, because that would also mean watching them die, too. I mean, who's to say it didn't happen at some point in time? So there might be some lineage of people still alive um, connected to Kane, like his direct bloodline or whatever, you know, so there might be something like that that ends up playing into the story. Or, I don't know, but. He's probably been super smart about it because like I was like, oh man, the fact is, I was like, oh, you want to find out if she's actually your granddaughter? Turns out not to be the case at all. Like they quickly answered that, being like, nope, that's Ray's granddaughter, so never mind. We also learned that he's actually he collects a lot of rocks. I'm sure he's collected them from all over the years and all the different places that he's ever been. Um, because they're they're like him, they never change. They always stay the same. So I guess like he can relate a lot to that. So that's why he keeps them. It's kind of interesting because it's almost it's almost kind of like. What would be like, it's almost an oxymoron in a sense. I know that's not a proper word, but I don't know what the proper word would be for it. Because it's like he loathes his immortality, but it's almost like he has a shrine to it in his home with all those different rocks. It's like all these different rocks he's collected over the years that he's lived in all the different places he's going to. And it's just, it's just to me, it's just kind of backwards a little bit. It's kind of like, it's like you love your immortality while at the same time hating it. I mean, it, you know, there's give and take with it, you know. So it's just, it's kind of an interesting thing to kind of think about. But when it was all said and done, like, you know, Chloe, he was kind of pushing more toward dating Chloe, but Chloe's like, no, I need someone who can be more open with me. And she was, just, you could tell she's very hesitant about the whole dating him because it's also, I wonder, is it because of Lucifer or is it just simply, or is it more, because the thing is Lucifer's, Lucifer's kind of guilty of that too. He doesn't always open up to her, but to be fair, he opens up to her a lot more than he would other people necessarily. I mean, he doesn't, I mean, he tries to tell her the truth, but obviously she doesn't believe him about everything he tells her. Cause like when he tried to like at the beginning of the season, open up to her, like, it's like, Oh, I thought you were really going to try it, but you didn't, you weren't going to, you know, cause he was trying to show her his devil face, but you know, obviously at the time it was stolen. So, so I was like, and at the same time, it's like, Oh, that's something both people, Pierce and Lucifer are guilty of. Um, but Pierce is talking about the fact is that he does want to give it a try. Because the last time, like as we saw, it's like with Kay, it's like, you know, you cut yourself off from people. No one's actually ever going to love you because you won't give them a chance to, you know. It's like because, you know, he was scared. And he even admits to himself, like he ran away from even that relationship and any other relationship just because he doesn't want to, because he doesn't want to get close to people just to watch them die all over again. And it's kind of also the whole, like continuing on a family by having children because you'll just outlive them too which also begs the question how why he ended up getting close to the center man considering the fact is that you know you, that's why you avoided people anyway so why specifically the center man was that just a situation you couldn't help but bring yourself connected to because that's still something we still don't know about that's something that i feel like it's still it was brought up but i feel like it was never completely answered like his connection to the center man but nevertheless and sadly things between lucifer and chloe aren't 
going forward because for him he's like he's kind of accepting things like if you end up wanting to date pierce it's okay i'm you know kind of being like i'm fine with our relationship staying the way it is and she's like oh you can stay or whatever but he's like no 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 like he's just rushing to kind of get out of there because he doesn't want her to see like you know trying to feign like it doesn't bother him when in actuality it does and that just sadly ends up just put like chloe was kind of on the fence but i think lucifer doing that because he wa he wants to do what's right by her like you know he doesn't want to be so caught up he doesn't want to be selfish and he's like i know how i feel about chloe and i don't want anyone interfering with our relationship but it's like you should date whoever you want to and i shouldn't really you know mind my own business type of thing so it just sadly pushes chloe closer to him but lo and behold what we do find out is a possibility i threw out last episode i'm like it turns out he is just using her. Getting close to Chloe is just a plan to him. Because I'm like, why Why the sudden change? And why Chloe specifically? Why not anyone else? I was thinking like, oh, maybe you could not be with Chloe and just be with, think, you know, um, Maddie. I know it's weird because she looks just like her grandmother. And you obviously had a thing for her grandmother. But still, I was like, maybe that's the direction we go. I was like, no. Uh, it's just he wants. So like, that's why I was like, why her specifically? And it turns out, oh, it's because he's using her. Like they they left they cleft it at that, but I threw that out as a possibility last episode because he thinks Lucifer and Chloe's relationship, their bond, is what makes their whole situation happen. And like she makes Lucifer mortal because how they feel about each other. Which to be fair, like you know, I don't know if he knows one hundred percent about their dynamic. But, you know, maybe it's because, I don't know, maybe, you know, because maybe in his eyes it's like, much like Lucifer's, like, Chloe was br brought into this world to always, like, end up being in Lucifer's path that they were kind of predestined to kind of have a thing for each other just because it was all of God's plan or whatever. I don't know. So, that's why I'm kind of still a little iffy because I'm like, why would you think? Because obviously it worked before they even heavily develop feelings but then again it's like doesn't it have to be like feelings of like intimacy it could just be like no they they have a bond together and he's trying to take that like and by doing that he can open up like the probably to him like the fastest way to create a bond like that is to develop feelings it's like well chloe already kind of shown she's already had interest in him so he's just acting upon that which is like very selfish and very douchey of him but to him it's like he doesn't see any other way unless this has something to do with lucifer maybe he's figured something else out and maybe he's thinking like if he put like i threw this out as a possibility as well like maybe he feels like if he can make lucifer jealous or bothered enough that eventually it will do something to make Lucifer act in a way or something like that. Or it could be his way of being like, well, if she's so important to Chloe, if God, if she's so important, if Chloe's so important to God and his whole plan with Lucifer is like, well, maybe he'll do something to me that if I'm too close to her, maybe he'll try to get rid of me. So maybe that's what he's open for. I'm kind of leaning more towards the first thing, like I brought up, you know, it being like creating a bond between them. But hey, maybe they're, I'm, I'm very interested to find out like what his plan is. Like I said, it's like, oh, like I'm not surprised, but at the same time, it is a little sucky that that just means you are using Chloe, which is like sad because she really is into you and you're, you're interfering between like Chloe and his relation, um, Lucifer's relations, which neither one, I mean, obviously Lucifer had the old marriage thing, which we know from the beginning was always a fraud, but Chloe's not really ever been in a relationship subsequently since the whole Dan situation, has she? I don't think so. So that's always, you know, something to kind of think about too. So it just, it sucks, but I'm very interested to see where like that whole situation goes. Also in this episode, we had things with Mays kind of taking a bad turn. Basically, Dan has to call her out because it's like she's having a party. She brought like strangers over to their house. Even one of those strangers was sleeping in Trixie's bed. And it's just like, this is my child's home. Like, you don't put them in danger. It's like, fine, we won't tell Chloe about this. So just clean the place up. It's like, oh, there's other things we cannot tell Chloe about. Oh, about how you and me killed the guy who killed her dad. And it's like... Obviously, you can tell, sadly, Maze is lashing out just because she's just in a spiral because she feels like, I don't know, she just feels kind of alone. The only friend she ever had, she's lost, you know, and so it's like, and she feels like she's supposed to fit this little mode of this is who she's supposed to be. And it's like, I'm not that person. She, she kind of snaps at Dan and stuff like that just because she's just kind of like. Yes, Maze is a little crazy sometimes, but she's kind of going full blown over for the whole pot situation with the teacher. She could have apologized and be like, well, I didn't know things were going to be that bad, but she kind of blows up and is just like, I don't care about Chloe, her goody two shoe self, and your stupid kid, which sadly Trixie hears that and kind of is very upset by it because like, Maze is like one of her best friends. And it's just, and you know, for Maze, it's like Trixie was the first human she ever got very close, even before Linda. And so, like, not only did one of her, 
like fr her best friendship with Linda, and now she's kind of messed up her friendship with Trixie too. And so, like I said, it's just a situation of Maze is spiraling because she just feels lost and she's just angry about it, like the whole situation, because it's like. I think it's a combination of just feeling betrayed as well as being super stubborn because she doesn't want to just, she doesn't want to really admit how she feels and she doesn't want to just let go because it's like, you know, she kind of probably wants, at this point in time, we'll probably see her embracing her demon side more. It's like, no, 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 I've been living this entire life. I mean, because it's interesting because they've always been her main reason for staying. Like, that was kind of the main reasons, like, she never probably, well, plus getting back to hell is probably a little harder, but they were always a big reason why she you know, like living here on Earth, much like Lucifer, like he found his way, she found hers, and now all of that's kind of slowly slipping away to the point she's even moving out. Not well, yeah. You know. It's just a sad set of circumstances, you know. You hope everything. Like I said, that's why. Like even I, last episode, I was like, man, I don't know where Linda or Maze are going to go from here, and even more so now. Like, what is Maze going to do? Where is she, she going to live on her own? Will she go back and kind of stay with Lucifer for a while? Like, what's she doing? What is she going to be up to? You know. With this all kind of being said and done, you know? And then on top of all this, there's also a mini deal running into Charlotte, which I was like, right, you are the only one who doesn't know about it. Because even Linda was kind of like, oh, I just assumed you'd know. Because I mean, even I kind of just assumed. I mean, I'm, in, in retrospect, it's like, right, you haven't been on camera together in that entire time she's been back and everything. Because he didn't even know that Linda, like, you know, Charlotte had come back to life after his mom left. So to him, it's like seeing her again. So, oh, my God, my mom. And it's like, nope, that's not the case. And he ends up spilling the beans to telling her everything. I haven't seen you since, like, the whole Flaming Sword situation going to, a, and, like, Charlotte's like, wait, what? And he's like, oh, never mind. He goes to tell Linda, which we have Linda's advice being like, do not tell her anything. It's like, I was in a stable condition when I ended up finding out the truth about all of this. It's like, in the situation that she's in, she's very vulnerable and fragile. It's like, I mean, who knows how she'll react to that? I mean, like, basically, that's some, like, earth-shattering information, like, learning the, like, cosmic stuff that went down and everything that she was kind of part of and everything. Granted, who's to say she'll believe? I'm curious to see what she does, because obviously, like, a big part of this is Lucifer, and it's like, oh, fine, like, if she finds out the truth and actually believes in Minadil, like, well, she, I mean, it's not something he can prove anymore, like, he doesn't have his wings, so she might just look at him and, like, oh, you're crazy, maybe I had a crazy breakdown, maybe something was in the water and we both are delusional. So maybe she'll even confront Lucifer, and then maybe his wings will come out at some point to kind of prove it. It's like, wait, it all was real, so... I don't know, man, like, it, this could have disastrous consequences, like, it, it could just make things for Charlotte worse, which is like, oh, she's trying to go forward, but at the same time, it's like, she wanted to know the truth, and it's like, doesn't she deserve to know the truth about everything that happened, that she isn't crazy about the whole going to hell experience, that she did die and go to hell and came back and everything, it might actually make, it might be, in the long run, the better thing, maybe it's something that should have waited until she was in a better situation, kind of, more okay but maybe that's just going to make her panic even more because it's like oh now i know for sure hell is real and she's going to try and like get herself in to be a good person and maybe she'll end up overcompensating or what you, you don't know what you know telling someone all that stuff could ultimately do to them and, and i'm very interested to see what direction that takes us because you know especially for a minute deal, he kind of thinks like I don't know what my next, you know, mission is, because, like, I did that whole situation with Cain and Lucifer, solved that. It's like, what else is my test? It's this whole waiting process a test, and he might look at this situation like, oh, me helping out Charlotte is my test. You know, he might, you know, a, you know, Aminadou is just assuming this all of the tests. Much like Lucifer thinks everything's part of it, their father's plan, Aminadou thinks the same way, too. Like, maybe free will is a thing, and that's the thing with this. Like, I kind of constantly bring it up. I think I brought it up last episode, too, but it's like, if they're reading so much into this, who's to say that God's paying that much attention? Maybe he's just letting things play out the way they are. I think I've even talked about that since, like, the beginning as being a thing. And it's not even just this season, always. Like, it doesn't mean necessarily that everything is connected. Maybe it's just a situation of, like, hey, just live your lives, you know? Maybe I did some stuff here and there, but what you've done and what happens around you is all you, you know? So, ultimately, we'll have to wait and see uh, what the next episode has in store for us with all of this. And now, moving on to this week's episode of Legends of Tomorrow. Uh, very nice episode with the way it was structured and everything. I did like it. It's almost kind of like a horror-esque episode. It's kind of like spooky. Like, almost have Sarah being like the monster and you're kind of locked in a specific... I don't know. It just kind of had like that horror feel. It wasn't scary, but it kind of had that kind of almost vibe to it. It's like a, almost like a monster movie type of feel. And I thought that's kind of... 
I mean, to be fair, she was kind of designed to be very monster-like. Uh, she was kind of creepy, just like, oh, she disappears one minute, and she's, like, right behind you the next, and just kind of systematically taking them all out one by one. Um, I like what they did with that whole situation, because obviously, like, out of anyone, you would assume, like, the Death Totem would specifically be tied to Sarah. You just assume. And it's something I kind of thought about before, too, was, and I, I might have brought this up last episode, I think I did, but I always thought, because it'd be kind of interesting, because it's like, well, with the death tone, you can raise the dead and stuff like that. I feel like it would have a connection to Sarah, and maybe it's something I didn't bring up last episode, but it's, I was definitely thinking this episode, maybe I thought it last episode, too, I don't remember, but... Because Sarah has the most experience with death. I mean, by that, I mean, because, because the fact is that she literally died and came back to life. So, like, obviously the totem was, it smells death on her. But it's not even just that. In particular, it seems like it smells like all the stuff she's ever done. In particular, it seems interesting because we get a look at more, like, because a lot of this deals with a lot of her time with the League of Assassins. That's when she did a lot of stuff just because it's like, well... She killed a lot of people. Because I was wondering what that little girl whole situation about. This, I, she saw the little girl. I was like, oh, is this supposed to be like a young Laurel kind of to mess with her head? It's like, no. It's a little girl who Sarah killed her dad in front of her. It was part of the whole League situation. So that darkness inside of her. And so that plays a big part in this whole situation. Because it because I said it, and it even seems like Mollus is even saying it, that uh, she plays a big role in, um, like, all, like, she was almost destined to take the death totem, apparently. So it's kind of interesting. Um, one of those things of like, oh, destiny of fate. Like, was she always supposed to follow the path that she was always supposed to to end up where she is now? So, like, is there a possibility of getting control of the death totem without kind of the side effects of Mollus? It turns out we understand why. I mean, also because of the darkness in her, but also because the uh, original totem bearer, uh, that belonged to that the death totem belonged to that tribe sided with um Mollus back in the day, so why it has even deeper connection. But um you can understand even more so why it ends up pulling on Sarah's strings more so than she dismantled a team. I mean, because for one, Sarah's already a deadly opponent. Added on top of that, like all the supernatural ability she got from like the death totem and that's scary to see what she's capable of. Basically, with Mollus' power, she basically made everyone see what they fear most. Obviously, for uh, Wally, it made him confront Jesse. For Nate, his grandfather. For Zari, her brother. Uh, we never actually got to see what anyone else's kind of fears kind of manifested themselves as, but we, we definitely got those top ones. So, also love the fact is that Rory constantly throughout the episode is like, "Yep, yeah, oh, so and so's dead," or. Uh, like Nate's going off by himself. And he's like, "Yep, yeah, you're you're gonna die." Also, love it's like uh, Nate's kind of like, "Okay, so I'm gonna go track down Sarah. If I'm not back in five minutes, like stay a little longer." He's like, "No, come rescue me." Um, so, like I said, I just like that style. Like obviously being spooky, but also having that little bit of humor mixed in. Obviously, that's just the nature of the show. But it's just it's a very nice. Um, like they do that. Like they do a little interesting aspects of time. Like um. The show because it isn't solely a time travel show it does have its moments of kind of tapping into other genres as well so i thought that was kind of a nice touch in this episode especially because i was kind of talking about that last episode with very, all the ghosts and stuff i was like oh, i'll be pretty neat if we kind of got like a more of a spooky angle to it and it's like well we kind of got that because sarah's very like ghost like uh with like the way her like how she looked her eyes her hair and everything so a big thing about this episode too that i also like was the whole aspect of ava ava's like whoa you call me your girlfriend and then she finds out about ava and uh, i mean that she found out about sarah and john it's like oh wait you slept together before we missed yeah but this before i had a girlfriend it's like oh you call me your girlfriend and then she meets up with john because she has no choice but to go to john for help and it's like oh i have to meet with you and everything and then like gary's there and he's here and like whoa you both slept with uh, captain lance it's like whoa but then we kind of hear like uh, Ava's kind of insecurity. She's like, I'm not jealous. Okay, maybe I am. But it's like, I don't know. Like Sarah said, I'm a girlfriend. But what if, you know, what if Sarah's not like a one woman girl? And you have Gary and you have Gary kind of being there. She's kind of opening up to him and John a little bit. She's being vulnerable, which is so interesting. Like I said, because like Ava, like until this whole Sarah situation came about, she wasn't very open. You see her just kind of letting her guard down and just being like, once again, adorable. It's, it's just the cutest thing ever. Just her. She's just kind of like, I, I don't know what, if, like, you know, what, if, what, if, what if, maybe, maybe it's, maybe it's real, maybe it isn't kind of those things. It's kind of like, that's so adorable that she's so flustered like that. And just hearing about like, oh yeah, like Sarah had this one night stand before we got together. Like, you know, jealous and stuff. It's, it's super adorable. 
And I also like Gary making the comparison between the Legends and his D&D crew. It's like, I love that. But while this was all happening, you also have Nora kind of messing with Sarah a little bit too, telling her to kind of give in, kind of making her confront everything. Because it's like, oh, Sarah, you're trying so hard to be someone else. But it's like, this is who you are. This is who you'll always be. Do you think Abel will really, really accept you? Because I would want to kill her, always a killer, and just kind of give in to that, you know? So, like, because initially I was thinking like, oh, yeah, like, he was like Mollus was setting her up to be like the perfect host, but it's like no, he's setting her up to be like the perfect general, you know, for his army essentially for this battle. That's kind of what he was he's setting Sarah up to be. So it does seem like in, in this particular episode she was able to fight it a little bit, but eventually Mollus kind of took back control completely. But he ultimately, you know, with Ava's help, kind of call, I'm calling out to her, she was able to kind of finally break free. Which, like I brought up earlier, I am curious to know, like, it might be a situation where Sarah will ultimately have to wield it, because they are probably going to need, I mean, it took five totems to kind of, like, seal Miles away, who said maybe six together will be enough to completely, you know, to destroy him once and for all. So, it might be a situation where Sarah will ultimately have to learn how to wield it, you know? It's that situation of, like, recognizing the darkness in herself, but kind of, like... Seeing what's deeper, what's below that, like the heart she has, being the person she is, that that darkness, what she did, yes, that will always be a part of her, but it doesn't have to define her. I think that's um, it's kind of something similar that's kind of happening with the whole um, Bruce's storyline and uh, Batman. I mean, I'm Gotham currently, so it's kind of like something like that, and I think that's probably what Sarah's gonna have to overcome. You know, she ends up sadly pushing Ava away. Um, even that last note, it's like, oh, this is this uh, space belongs to uh, Sarah Lance's girlfriend. I'm like, oh, that's uh, because Sarah kind of breaks it off because Sarah doesn't want to get Ava dragged in on all of this because Sarah's like, oh, this is my darkness. Ava's too much of a good person for me to kind of get her swallowed up in all of my BS, which once again, we still don't know what like Ava's whole situation is. I kind of threw out there like, oh, yeah, that she's an anachronism. Maybe there's more to it than that. I don't know. I feel like... um. Rip wouldn't be so bleh about if it was, she was just an anachronism because it just, I don't know, maybe maybe that is what it is, but I'm now I'm sitting on it a little bit more, I'm kind of like, no, nah, there's got to be more to it. What exactly? Well, we'll have to wait and find out. But obviously, it's just one of those situations of like, you know, I don't want to put you in danger, and it's like, me being who I am, it's like, because... Even Mollus kind of pointed at it. It's like, oh, you were always afraid of being a monster. Now you are. And Sarah doesn't, you know, want Ava to see her like that. So she's just kind of like, you know, I don't, you know, want, you know, maybe in Sarah's mind, it's like, once this is all said and done, when I'm able to kind of fight back my darkness, maybe, maybe I can try and start things up again. But for now, she wants Ava far away because it's like, you deserve to be with someone that's right for you, a good person. You know, Sarah doesn't look at herself that way, which is sad. She's super harsh on herself. Um, something her and Oliver, like, severely have in common. Like, they are probably the, I mean, to be fair, it's kind of like a big hero thing to kind of beat on yourself the most. Like, you're the, you, I mean, that's kind of just a per people thing in general, just being, like, your biggest critic. But I think it applies in these cases. Like, like the main heroes, like Sarah, Oliver, uh, Barry, and Kara, and Jeff, like, you know, from um, Black Lightning, I think they all beat up on themselves, like, the most. You know, you're always going to be the most hypercritical of yourself, you know, especially under those circumstances, so. I think that's a nice little aspect that I feel like these shows kind of nail that turmoil of like, you know, thinking always second guess, like having to not second guess yourself while also second guessing yourself because you're just kind of, you have so much doubts about your own self, you know? So, I don't know, it's just kind of an interesting thing I was thinking about. So, I also appreciate that, um, like, they were trying to track down the um, Wave Rider, but it's like, how am I, like, I'm the master of dark arts. I'm not like, you know, that doctor what's his face or whatever and then they're like who and he's like exactly I was like shut up with your doctor who jokes yes it's like it must just it has to be for the fact is that people probably you can't help but make comparisons between this and doctor who, especially when you have um the actor who plays rip arthur um being having been a companion on doctor who so you can't help but have that comparison, but also just the styles of the show. So I'm sure that's the thing everyone makes. So obviously they had to go, okay, we acknowledge it too. So I'm like, it was just, it was just, it's just this little thing. I was like, ah, you made a Doctor Who joke. Nevertheless, what really took me by surprise was the fact is that Mick is the bearer of the fire uh, totem, which makes perfect sense. I kind of had the feeling like it's like the one of those totems is going to basically go to everyone on his team, isn't it? 
So that was kind of interesting. I mean, maybe not necessarily everybody because the uh, Earth totem didn't work for Nate. So that might go to somebody else, you know? I don't know. Maybe, maybe Wally? Might end up being right for all we know. Because basically, obviously, it manifests itself as your true, you know... It really only belongs to, like, you know, someone most heroic. And that's why Mick was like, I'm not the one that should use this fire tone. But it's like, Amaya's like, you try to hide it, but basically you are more, like, the fact is, your past, everything that ever, you've been ever associated with, being a criminal, being a bad guy, your situation with his family, like, like all that could have corrupted you completely. But the fact of the matter is, you joined the legend shows. The fact is, they you changed. And once again, like Mick is one of those characters. Like he doesn't seem like he's changed, but wholeheartedly he has changed. And so he's able to use it. So I wonder is that going to be something? I mean, we did see that his gun did get broken this episode, so it might be a situation like, well, for now I'm just going to use the totem. Eventually, by when it's all said and done, he's just going to have to get his gun repair. I would assume if anyone would fix it with Cisco. Isn't Cisco where they originally, because I know that's where Captain Cold, de definitely, I was like, because I know that's where Snart got his gun from with Cisco. I think it was Cisco, Cisco ended up making one that Snart ended up stealing, and then they ended up getting one made for a heat wave, right? Wasn't that it? Or did they both steal theirs at the same time? It's been a while. That was back in like season two? No, 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 that was season one of The Flash, right? Like I said, it's been a while. Uh, but nevertheless, so that's kind of interesting, and seeing him kind of control it so well, so... I'm interested to see that kind of continue, but also, like I said, see who the Earth Totem belongs to. Is it just because what Nate was going through at the time that it didn't activate? Or does it belong to, you know, him? Does it belong to... Ray? Mm. Or is it going to be one of those situations where it's like... Amaya uses it, and the spirit goes to someone else like Nate. I don't know. We'll, we'll ultimately have to see. It might even go to Wally, but I feel like... I don't know. There's a part of me that wonders, like, would it even go to Wally, considering him being a speedster and everything? I mean, which, you having superpowers shouldn't be a deterrent on that. I mean, I, I would assume it would be a big reason, like, you don't necessarily need the totem, considering you already have powers in there. That's... I don't know. We'll, we'll have to wait and see about that. They did it this episode, too. I'm curious, like... Um, the whole like splitting up. I wonder if that's something we're going to see them do more in the past. I mean, in the future or not. Or whether it's just going to be like a stick together. Which I even love Gary being like, oh, no, the legends would be fine as long as they stick together. Hard cut to, all right, let's go our separate ways. It's like, ugh. Typical horror movie things. You don't split up. What I also found very interesting is at the very end we had John uh, playing... Uh, D&D &D with Gary and his people. And then he just kind of, we see him tossing the dice up. So... Which I didn't comment on. I'm actually super surprised we got more John this season. Like, already a second episode. I was like, I didn't expect that. I mean, this is like his third time popping up in the grand scheme of the Arrowverse. Technically fourth, considering he, like, mid -season, in the mid-season finale, he bobs up at the very end of the episode. But nevertheless, um, I guess that, I mean, especially with this whole Mala situation, I guess it makes sense that he is going to be uh, probably up here a lot. So, like I said, this is probably also set up for, like I said, I don't know the whole state of his situation with, like, the show and everything. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't know. We'll wait and see. Because I don't think I was seeing something else. I was like, oh, should Constantine get a second season or something like that? I mean, it's been a while. Like, it's been a few years since. Because that was like around season four of Arrow that that happened, right? So, nevertheless. Um, I'm just, I'm curious to see what they do with John going forward. Maybe he'll end up being one of the totem bearers i wouldn't assume so i don't know i do like that they are incorporating his story too because it's like you know you had mollus kind of being like oh yeah it's me astra you know one life for another and then but you know you had john be like she's astra's in hell it's like there's no you don't just come back from hell so he didn't buy into it but then sarah asked him about it later he's like oh yeah i totally would have if it meant getting astra back i guess at a, in a sad way it's him his way of kind of making up for his sin even if he had to damn sarah forever if it meant making up for his past sin didn't you know leaving him himself that guilt then maybe um you know he would have made that choice i don't know he says he would but i don't know if he really would have you know I mean, to do what he does, he kind of talks about being alone, like, because he doesn't want to get people caught down the path that he's on, you know, so, but, like, you know, that's why he handles things alone, but he's like, Sarah's not alone, because not only does she have Ava, she has an entire group of legends beside her, too, and I think that was something that Sarah didn't outright say, but I think 
could be inferred is because it's like, oh, you can have this life without pain and regret. And I think for Sarah, she'd rather hold on to that pain and regret because she doesn't want to forget the things that she does. She's done. And she said to herself, she's like, I owe it to that little girl. You know, to make like she's doing all this to also make up for all the bad stuff that she's ever done. This, in, in particular, with the league, and that's something I'm curious too. That when Sarah thinks about that and looks at that, does she think like, oh yeah, this is all because of my time with like that darkness only popped up because of my experience with the league? But it's like, has that darkness always been inside of her, and the league just basically gave it more of a form, a physical form, an outlet? Or, you know, you know, like I said, which way is that? I wonder how does she look at it? I mean, I guess in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter whether it's always been there or whether it manifested itself because of the league. At the very least, it's there and it's it was there then and it's there now. And I guess that's all that really matters in the grand scheme of things. Oh, and also, final note, I didn't pay attention to it before, but uh, I saw it happen to see his name, John Noble. I, I was like, wait, what? Like... Uh, I had no idea that was Tim being Mollus until I started hearing Mollus' voice. I'm like, oh, that's only John Noble. Which, what was it recently? I swear he popped up in something recently that I was kind of like losing my shit about. Was it this? Has he, he hasn't physically popped up in the show, has he? But maybe I saw his name before. Like, I, I know I've seen John Noble in something like super recently that I, like, not even just Sleepy Hollow. I felt like it was something like super recent that I was kind of like, commenting on. I was like, oh yeah, John, no. Cause it just I was like, cause I was thinking about him recently and I don't remember why. And it's bothering the crap out of me. But nevertheless, uh very good episode. Uh, I'm very interested to see where all this kind of continues for, especially, you know, they making the D D comparisons and stuff like that. Is that something we're gonna see going forward or is it just for this particular episode that we get to see that I don't know. Either way the battle is far from over. And so I'm interested to see uh, where it takes us in the next episode. And now moving on to this week's episode of Ollie Zombie. Very nice episode. It has a very nice overall uh, closing to like the case and everything too. Like a lot of stuff in the episode, but in particular the case. I was actually kind of surprised just how easily it was solved. It's just like, oh, Robbie had to kind of draw the killer in and kind of act as bait. Pickle, pickle, pickle. And I'm sure that, yes, there, you will be hearing more about Mr. Pickle, Robbie. He's, he's like, I hope that doesn't become a thing. I'm sure it's going to totally be a thing. But nevertheless... It was just kind of interesting. I mean, to be fair, they call it Bruce, but obviously the group he belongs to, as, as well as any other group that is like him, still exists. So I thought there might have been a little more complexity to it. Like, oh, yeah, Bruce isn't necessarily the one that did it. Maybe it just seems like he was, but it's like, nope, he definitely did it. So kind of a pretty open and shut case when they finally got him. Uh, but like continuing what the first uh, episode and uh, the first part of this kind of did, I like like I said the kind of voice voiceover because like obviously it happens in episodes, but I feel like these episodes has popped up the most because it fits this brain. Like I said, it's almost like she's like she's telling this story from like a future perspective of kind of like all looking back, almost like she's writing this down in a diary type of thing. To be fair, like I I keep associating it with Bridget Jones' diary, but to be fair, I mentioned it last week. I don't really know those movies that well so it's hard to really kind of reference them like that but I, I get a feeling like that's kind of what they were aiming for but nevertheless and sad, luckily nothing did ever happen with Alan because Alan didn't pop up this episode uh, she did still get caught up and sprung on Tim she ended up cooking a whole bunch of like sweets and stuff like that and she's just kind of like oh what what if I never meet Tim again and she's just like oh she's just so heartbroken and stuff like that about it, and it finally meets up with Tim later on. But it's like, oh, she finds out that Tim went to a church, most likely the one, um, Angus's church, and he's just like, oh yeah, where humans belong. It's like, oh, where do humans belong? It's like it's food, and just like, yep, he's a zombie supremacist, and it's just kind of like, okay, you're disgusting. She's like, I'm gonna go meet my friends. I don't even know your need to know your last name. He's like, it's Timerson. She's like, it's your name is Tim Timerson. It's like, okay, good riddance, because it was a thing of like, you know. Major had to point out, like, do you actually even know anything about this dude? And which kind of made her go, no, 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 I need to. And it's like, good thing she did, because then it would have been, would have been super awkward if things kind of went too far. And then eventually it's like, oh, yeah, she dropped, he takes you to the church. And it's like, that's how you run into Angus? Like, that'd be interesting. Obviously, Major has his running, but obviously I'll get to that later. And I was like, that's so interesting. So I'm glad that's kind of over and done. So, I don't know. We'll see what happens with Liv going forward because, like, you know, the relationships don't always work out. Um, I guess we're not going to see Justin at all this season because, like, he hasn't popped up at all. So, all her past relationships have kind of been unsuccessful. Like, her and Major being a thing, it's just kind of an on and off thing. But then again, it's kind of one of those things where it's like, it's because it's such familiar territory, that's why they kind of start 
keep going down that route because it was something good. Obviously, at one point in time, they were going to get married. But then I guess that also fits the situation there now because it's like, do we, you know, we're not the same people we were then. So obviously, we still, maybe we were, we were good and great then, but it's like, we aren't those same people. Like over the course of this series, we've both changed a lot. You know, they've gone through a lot. So they're not the same people. They've had different experiences. You know, so. I think that kind of plays into it. So I think that just might be a, an aspect of Liv's show, uh, story in this. I mean, we'll have to wait and see. I'm not gonna say, because currently Major and Drake are the only, not Drake, uh, Justin are the only SOs she's had that things didn't end terribly. Things kind of ended bad like, with Justin, sure, and kind of with Major, but it's like, uh, Major's still in her life, and then, you know... It, it wasn't a Lowell or Drake situation, so there's that. I think Drake's situation is probably the worst of it, considering the fact is that it was Liv who had to put him down, so there's that. Nevertheless, lots of other things to kind of break down about this episode. Obviously, you have Liv still trying to get uh, Clive and Michelle together. I, I'm, I'm assuming that's going to stop going forward, but I would love, to, like, because she's not going to be on that brain anymore, so I'm sure um, it's not going to be an issue anymore, but I'd be so interested to see that still being, like, I'm curious to see what they do with Michelle going forward, whether she is just, like, is it going to be a situation of, like, well, all this stuff of putting her and Clive together, and it's like, oh, they actually, something does kind of happen from that, obviously, I'll get, well, I'll get to that soon enough, but, like, obviously, like, Liv was kind of beating around the bush, and she wouldn't tell Clive everything that was going down. She just kept being like, oh, you know, human-zombie relationships don't really work out. Maybe you should not be with Vazio anymore. Maybe be with Michelle. But obviously, Clive, like, didn't take like that. It's like, yo, this is my relationship. Stay the hell out of it. Because for him, it's like, I know this is in a brain. I know this is you talking. Not any brain would make you say that. So only you would be stopping saying that. So stop it. But obviously, like, Liv is only doing it because she cares. It's like, Clive is her friend. And obviously, she doesn't want to tell him outright because she doesn't want to break his heart. The reason why she hasn't told him so far but she just wants she wants him to be happy and like you know it's like oh you don't just you don't dale doesn't deserve you she's gonna go behind your back and betray him turns out uh as i figured you know one of the options i said last season was like in the last episode was like oh, she might clive might know about it and it turns out that's the case they have a quote-unquote open relationship it's not clive's thing but you know he loves bazio and he's willing to do anything to make it work so obviously she has her like zombie needs that she needs to take care of which obviously the conversation makes it seem like they could equally have one, but it's just like, you know, Clive's not acting upon him. Because obviously hearing about all the dudes that Bazio's with, it just kind of pisses him off. And then Liv's like, oh, well, the, you know, the whole Michelle situation can make it better. He's, and he's like, too soon. So that kind of brings open the window and be like, oh, that could be potentially something we see. That eventually maybe Clive goes, all right, you know, maybe I deserve to kind of be a little happy in this relationship too. That's just going to make things weird and complicated. I mean, to be fair, you'd have to find someone that's super open to the whole idea. Like, and I don't, I don't know if Michelle would necessarily be okay with being like, oh yeah, an intermediate party uh, to your whole relationship situation. It's just, it's kind of a weird situation. So, like I said, I don't know. Maybe we'll see more of Michelle kind of in that light, or maybe we'll just see her kind of develop in a different direction. I'm fine with either or. It'd be kind of interesting to dive into her, just since they went out of their way to introduce her. I'm curious to see what she's all about. Um, also, in this episode, we found out more about who Renegade is. That was kind of interesting. I was like, okay, yeah, she brought it up before that she knew Liv and Robbie. It was like, how does she know? It turns out she's a character from season one. I'm like, what? I zombie, you did that. That's crazy. Because basically, she, and she even brings it up too. She's like, she actually doesn't know how she actually became a zombie. She just remembers waking up and become uh, because of uh, because of the hunger. So it's not even like Fillmore Graves. Like she's been a zombie before this whole situation went down. In fact, she tried to go to um the police about Blaine, everything he was doing in season one, killing homeless kids, and, and like much like Lowell finding out the truth about what happened she found out the same way and so she tried to go to the police sadly the captain at the time uh was part of blaine's you know crew so and obviously he was still alive so that means it was definitely super like uh season one obviously with the whole storyline and everything but it's like oh yeah her hubby hubby max got killed and it's like that was kind of a warning for her and then it's like i feel like i remember those episodes but once again i mean that episode like her character in particular they even showed it. i feel like i might remember those scenes but i don't remember the entire context to them but it's like yo like that's i'm glad that they show that like yo so that's so interesting because for her, it's like she didn't do anything back then after Max died. She just kind of fell apart. She tried to do the right thing. Nothing came about, so she didn't do anything. When there was a whole bunch of zombies being created and stuff like that, she didn't do anything. So she wanted to do something now. 
because that's why she it seems like she admires Liv's Liv because she knows what Liv does like that's like ever since meeting Liv and probably finding out like about that whole situation like she knows what Liv's been doing like the entire time she's been a zombie like what she's you know trying to be of use to do you know do some good with what she's been given and so I think you know Renegade kind of wants to do the same thing Sadly, Blaine ends up catching her and ends up taking her to Chase, which last thing we see is Chase looking at her. I don't think Chase is going to kill her. Yes, she she feeds into the problem a little bit more about how, you know, making more zombies and stuff like that. Obviously, she's making zombies for people like because she only people she making the zombie are the people she cared like thinks like they need. It's like, no, I need to be a zombie. Because I was like, oh, because that's what kind of threw me off by, because I didn't know she was a zombie. And I was like, oh, so, but now it's like, in retrospect, it's like, oh, she's only making people zombies if, like, they're in life-threatening and they want to be whole again. And it, they want it, you know? It's not like she's just, you know, it's just kind of like, a, oh, and it's just part of the deal. It's like, no, like, if they ask her for it, so. But I don't think Chase is going to kill her. I think most likely he's probably going to approach her about a business opportunity, her working alongside Fillmore Graves, like, probably using her resources to sneak stuff in or out of Seattle or something like that. I, I don't know what he, I mean, because they do need more brains. So maybe that might be something to use her contacts to get more brains snuck in, maybe like some cadavers where it's like, oh yeah. And like they can, you know, like try and fix their like brain issues that's slowly becoming more and more and more of an issue. So that's where my mind goes, but we'll have to wait and ultimately see where that goes. I'm also curious to see what this means for Blaine going forward, because for Blaine, it's like, obviously, now he has a lot less um, to deal with Fillmore Grace, because obviously, Chase won't be busting his balls about stuff from now on, so Blaine has a lot more room to breathe and continue, obviously, his criminal enterprise, which obviously is going to bother the hell out of um, Renegade, considering the fact of the matter is, it's because it is said criminal enterprise that our hubby died that the innocent kids were killed so it's kind of like a she's obviously not a big fan of Blaine so also uh we had that whole Tucker situation like oh yeah he's a zombie now and then literally one of his friends was like oh yeah you need to take care of that and it's like wow literally telling him to kill himself I mean to be fair Tucker was kind of all about it before but now obviously his mind's changed it's like one thing to ask him to do it but it's like it's still like he just he couldn't do it this time so he ends up stumbling upon Angus's church, which Angus and it, it's a very interesting thing. Like it's already been kind of set up, but like we're excavating, like not excavating, um, escalating. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Either way, um, the whole situation is rising up because it's like not only are they kind of being against humans, obviously we heard from Tim how they feel about humans should be food and stuff like that, but also against zombies, in particular feel more grave zombies because it's like, oh, they care more about humans. They're trying to protect humans rather than protecting and feeding us. Uh, so they even got you trying to pretend to be more human, got you dressing and acting more human. It's like, bump that. So basically, uh, Angus is raising an army that will, you know, basically destroy both sides. Those sides being Fillmore Graves as well as the human side. Because, like, oh, you humans should basically bow down to us. Your place on the food chain is that. Food. So there's that. I was kind of interesting when Major kind of ran into the place. And even Angus, and, and Angus like, oh, because he knows who exactly Major is. Because, obviously, all the Chaos Killer stuff and then eventually, like, at the end of season two, when he helped liberate all those zombies, like, it's like, oh, because of that, Angus was willing to let him go. It's like, ah, uh, obviously, some heroes kind of get lost along the way. But, you know, so I'm interested to see what anything come from that. It might be a situation where they're going to have um, him go undercover. Uh, which, to be fair, Major's super good at because he kind of did that um, back in season two with the whole Chaos Killer situation. Didn't he have to go undercover to get close to people? I could have sworn that was a thing. Well, I know he kept an eye on people and stuff like that. I don't remember if he necessarily ever... Did he ever go undercover? I don't remember. Now, wasn't his whole situation with Fillmore Graves originally him going undercover? Actually, I'm actually blanking on that now. I, I do apologize. I'm, I, I can't believe I'm letting that slip my mind. But nevertheless, I get the feeling that's what's most likely going to happen. Like, uh, you're going to have Chase send him there to kind of figure that organization out and try and dismantle it. Because it's not like they could use force because they already hate Fillmore Graves and all that's going to do is, like, make matters even worse. So we'll probably have to wait and see, like, how things kind of play out with that also like you know tucker's friends i like that it was major who handled that it's just like oh it's like trying to the other two like um 
cadets trying to keep it cool, cool and calm. And then one of the dudes is like, oh yeah, maybe you should make me a zombie like the old fashioned way. And kind of be like referencing sex. And the major just hits him with the bottom of the gun and then fires some bullets at the drinks. I'm like, yeah, 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 major. It's like, yo. It's like, this time you ain't got to worry about the cadets. Like, you keep running your mouth, you're going to have to deal with me. It's like, I was originally going to pay your friend, but now because of your stupid mouth, your friend's not going to get even the $500 I was offering him. So, your luck. So, overall, it's some very interesting uh, developments. I also appreciate at the end, when he was on that wrestler brain, he's just like, ooh, yeah! Kind of going all uh, Macho Man Randy Savage and just being like, um... I know this is kind of wrong. This is weird for me to be yelling this to your face. But basically just telling Liv that like, hey, he wishes her all the best. Like he, like no matter what their political differences are, is like we're still going to be friends. And the fact of the matter is he's like, uh, you know, as long as she's happy, I'm happy for her. It's a little weird to look at this. Be, it's a little awkward in this situation, but I'm happy for her. And I'm, I'm happy that she's happy type of thing. And just... I just loved it. And it's just, it is a beautiful thing, too, at the very end. The little dance-off they have in a scratching post. And also what Liv says, because it's like, oh, yeah, if these are my soulmates, I consider myself lucky. Like, people and friends just come and go, but, like, these are soulmates. Like, Ravi, Peyton, and um, Major. And I just, like, that was just a beautiful thing. Because even through this entire series, like, they've been, like, obviously... Things have been a little weird with Major. Things have been a little weird with Peyton in the past, but now she has them. She has this uh, tight knit group. So, um, I don't know. I thought it was just kind of a lovely sentiment, especially to kind of end the episode off on some very positive and beautiful outlook on things. So, also, really quick, so I know I won't break up at the end. It's something Blaine said in early in the episode because he ate that dude's brain last episode. Basically, it's like, oh yeah, he, he kind of can't help but tell the truth. It's kind of like a liar, liar situation. And what was kind of interesting, like all the stuff he was saying, and there's also like the fact that he was kind of like, I've never actually been happy in my life. Even when I was a kid, I've never been happy. I was like, oh wow, that's, that's super sad. That's that's that that's the type of sad that cuts you deep. It's like that's why you are the kind of terrible human being, well, zombie person, person that you are, being the terrible, not caring about people at all person that you are. I mean, to be fair, he has cared about people in particular. Peyton. I mean, to be fair, he still lied to her, so that kind of like null and voids all that you know extra caring about people because you lied straight to her face to everyone's faces for so long about the whole zombie cure thing which that's still an element to play you know obviously Donnie's kind of like oh my god we're going to be super rich because there's only like well 15 cures left now so I mean that's a question too like what's going to happen with those cures like I mean especially under these circumstances zombieism is going to be a lot more widespread I kind of have the inkling I think maybe what's it what was it? was it this or something else I kind of like talked about it but I always thought like when it's all said and done this series would probably end with Liv becoming human again, because I think she'd probably, like, like she's never had an opportunity as as a human again, because Major's been human, zombie, human, you know, so it's bounced back and forth, but Liv's never had that opportunity, so I'm curious, I get the feeling like, always like, that's the direction the series is going to end with, but it might be a situation where she stays a zombie forever, because of it. I think it was like a video or something I talked about that, my thoughts on that, uh, being that she'd probably stay a zombie forever, because, like, she could ultimately do more good, I don't remember what. It might have been that video where I talked about living a uh, personality sponge. That might have been that video. It might not have been. I might have just been thinking that. I might not have ever said anything about it. Nevertheless, I'm going off on a huge tangent. Like I said, uh, very nice episode. I'm very interested to see what goes down in the next episode. Also, one final note I was also thinking about, too. Wasn't that, um, God, um... Blaine's bodyguard, like, when, uh, when they went to get Renegade, the dude that went in, isn't that the dude who let, um... Angus go, because at first I was like, oh, because I think I just assumed he was dead, I mean, he took a blow to the head, doesn't mean he was actually dead, but I'm like, in retrospect, I'm like, oh yeah, because obviously you wouldn't tell Blaine about his dad being free, because that would raise questions about, for one, how do you know my dad's free, it's like, well, oh, you went out there to check, but what made you decide to go check, uh, which also says a lot that Blaine hasn't been back there to realize his dad's not, there. but to be fair, like, the whole torture thing, I mean, probably, like, he probably won't even bother, really know until, like, something comes up and he's like, oh, I need to talk to my dad face to face, he'll probably go, Huh? I don't hear anything. I hear nobody eating or anything. Because, you, you know, his dad was at the bottom of the well, so it wouldn't, you know, in the state he was in, wasn't really all talkative and stuff. Like, I don't know. It just, it just kind of got me thinking about that. So, I mean, who knows how long it'll be until Blaine finally finds out about, oh, yeah, his dad's not only not in there, is amassing an army of his own, which could eventually turn his dad good use against him, especially in his dad's kind of like, 
holy crusade that he's going through now. It's kind of like that seems very like, likely that Blaine would be taken out of the equation. Um, also, what about that Russ douchebag? Um, still kind of a dick. I guess he's probably slowed down on like business considering the last time like he kind of got involved like Angus and his people like killed all those zombies that were buying brains. I mean, to be fair, he hid so he didn't get caught up in all of that, but he witnessed it. So, And he hasn't said anything about it either, so I think that says a lot. So, Like I said, we'll just have to wait and see where all, all of that heads. Anyway, really that's all I want to talk about in this episode. Until the next time we meet, be happy, be safe, live life to the fullest, and enjoy it. Good day and good